Good evening, everyone, and thanks for attending. On behalf of Northern Annual Healthcare District, thank you for attending this evening educational presentation as part of the district's ongoing Healthy Lifestyles talk series. My name is Rosie Graves, and I am honored to help the community as part of the district's oncology patient navigator for the past six years. Going Beyond Pink is presented by the district's breast health program team of experts. We have Dr. Eva Wassa, Dr. Cheryl Olson, Dr. Faris Ahmed, and certified lymphedema therapist, Dana Georgeson, and myself. Please hold your questions until after the team has finished their presentations. Let's start going beyond pink, pink, excuse me, let's start going beyond pink with Dr. Faris Ahmed. Dr. Faris Ahmed has been working at Northern Annual Healthcare District since 2018. He is part of the Tahoe Carson radiology team that brings their expert radiologists here to Northern Indian Healthcare District and the Eastern Sierras. He has completed medical, he completed medical school, radiology residency, and interventional radiology fellowship at the University of Colorado, then completed his surgical internship at the St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver. Dr. Ahmed has a special interest in interventional, radio, interventional oncology with specialized treatments in cancer, including radioembolization, chemoembolization, as well as percutaneous tumor ablation. When not at work, he enjoys skiing, biking, kayaking, and footing the beautiful Tahoe and Washoe basins with his wife and daughter. And there you go, Dr. Ahmed. Hello, thanks for having me. I think I got the mute, yes. Um, do you have my slides up? How do I, there we are. So yeah, just a quick review of our breast cancer screening program and why we do it. Um, you can go to the next slide. Or can I advance the slides? I don't think I can. He's working on it. One sec. Great. So, you know, this will be a quick talk just to talk about why, why we do mammograms for cancer screening and how does it help and what to do if you get a recall. So you can go to the next slide. Then the next slide. So these are a little couple years old, but still relevant. Breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in women. About 13% of all women will be diagnosed with a breast cancer during their lifetime. And we see annually in the US, you know, 30% of all new cancer cases are a breast cancer. And there's tens of thousands of women who are affected by this every year and who die from it. Um, and we've noted, we've studied this since the 80s. You can go next slide. Next slide. You know, since mammographic screening was widely, widely introduced in about 1989, we've seen a 40% reduction in mortality from this, mainly from being able to catch these cancers when they're small and before they metastasize to other parts of the body. And that lets us really treat them when they're most treatable. Uh, you can go next slide, next slide. And yeah, th this reiterates that really screening, uh, there's been lots of trials performed to demonstrate that screening between the ages of, above the age of 40 really reduces breast cancer death, even, uh, even into older ages. Uh, next slide. And what I mentioned, you know, catching these cancers early means you get you need a less extensive surgery and less chemotherapy, and the chemotherapy that you might need is more effective when the cancers are smaller. Next slide. Next slide. You know, we still recommend screening at age 40. A lot of people have questions about that. The main reason is a lot of cancers are found in, in people from ages 40 to 49. Um, the risk is still real, and we see this is the population that could benefit most from getting a cancer detected early, just because they do have longer to live and you can get more benefit years from this basically. Next slide. Um, yeah, and this is to reiterate the same sort of idea. Next slide. 
Next slide. And one question we often get is the, the US Preventative Service Task Force, their recommendations are a little different. Um, part of that is they use different data to study it and their goals were different. Um, and we come back to the same idea that screening at 40 really shows the most benefit, especially to the individual. And some of their recommendations are based more on say national kind of values and costs and other things associated with it that might not be assessed to you individually. Uh, next slide. And this is to show that, you know, the 40% number is really the highest. And we get that with screening starting at age 40 and screening every year. Uh, next slide. And then next slide. Next slide. And so this to come back, you know, probably the worst thing everyone thinks about what happens when you come in for a mammogram and you get a call that you need to come back. And it's, it's very nerve wracking. It's, it's a very stressful time. And I, I want you to know for most people, it, it, it isn't a stressful occurrence. Most mammograms are normal, 90% of them. And, you know, 10% we bring back and most of those are normal too. And of all of the mammograms we do, about 4% need follow-up. Half of that meaning just maybe some more pictures over the next year and two. Uh, and half of that meaning a needle biopsy, which is something we do in the office. It's fairly quick. We you just use local, there's no sedation and it gives us an answer relatively quickly. So for most people having a mammogram results in no further tests. And for a small number that do have to come back, most of those are normal too. And even though it's a very, very stressful time, the probability that there's something bad is still very low, even though breast cancer is very common. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and this, uh, part of this is coming back, uh, you know, our, our mantra for screening is we always like to be safe. And so we, we tend to make sure something's not cancer by either doing a biopsy if it looks suspicious or following it closely if it's suspicious because the main thing is we don't wanna let a cancer go. Uh, next slide, next slide, I think. Yep, next slide, next slide, next slide. And yeah, this is to talk about at the end, you know, we have a lot of therapies for breast cancer these days, but it starts with getting the cancer and getting the diagnosis, which is, which means getting the mammogram and then a biopsy to follow. Next slide. Um, and then I won't go into this today, but for some people, there are different recommendations for screening at an earlier age or with ultrasound and MRI, and that depends on personal risk factors. Uh, next slide, that should be it. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, very much. Our next presenter is Dr. Eva Wassa. Dr. Wassa graduated from Cairo University Medical School she received her Diploma of Pathology from Cairo University Medical School. She then obtained her MRC PATH degree from London as she is a member of the Royal College of Pathologists. From USC, she completed her residency and fellowship. She is board certified in anatomic and clinical pathology. She has been at NIHD since 2001 as pathologist and lab director. Thank you, Dr. Wassa. In addition to NIHD, she has worked at French Hospital in Los Angeles, Arcadia Methodist Hospital, Alhambra Hospital, and Santa Marta Hospital. In her spare time, when she's not driving up the 395 every week, uh, you'll find Dr. Wassa enjoying her family with her husband, two daughters, son, and six grandchildren. She also loves to cook, paint, and sew. Thank you, Dr. Wassa. Thank you for having me. Next, please. Yeah, like Dr. Ahmed said, we start off, you know, after the radiologic and mammographic uh, uh, 
uh, examination, if there is anything suspicious, we do a needle biopsy, and that's usually done by the mammographer or the geographer. And um, that's a picture of the, the breast and the different lobules that collect into uh, the nipple. That's where the milk secretion uh, goes through. And then, next one, please. That's what we receive from the needle biopsy. The one on the left is um, a few cores of tissue that include the lesion. And then on the right is what we look at under the microscope. Next, please. There are several types of surgical specimens after, you know, after the needle biopsy, after, after verification that the patient has cancer. Either lumpectomy, where they remove the, the breast mass that includes the tumor, or mastectomy, which is different kinds, simple mastectomy that's uh, without the lymph nodes, and modified radical mastectomy that includes the axillary lymph nodes. And there are other kinds of mastectomy, which is nipple, scaring, uh, nipple sparing mastectomy. And probably Dr. Uh, Olson will uh, explain that. And then the axillary lymph nodes, there is two kinds of axillary lymph node biopsies that we get. Usually we start off by the sentinel lymph nodes, which is the lymph nodes, which get closest to the tumor and which drain the tumor immediate, um, the sentinel uh, guard lymph node that if that's positive, usually if any no lymph node is positive, that will be the, the usual one. And then they can proceed to axillary resection, including all the axillary lymph nodes. Next, please. And that's the type of specimens with partial mastectomy that we have. On the left, that's how we receive the specimen. And then on the right, we usually, and the, and the surgeon puts different markings for orientation, where is the, upper end of the specimen, the deep end of the specimen, and so that we know if there is any tumor close to one edge, we know which edge it is. And for that, we usually ink the specimen in different colors. And these colors stay through the processing procedure. And, and then if the tumor is close to the, for instance, green, green inked, margin and we know that the green ink margin is the superior margin then we say the tumor is at the superior margin and so forth next and then we cut the specimen into several pieces like that we we're making a point of orientation which piece belongs to which part of the specimen and then we submit them in different in a lot of cassettes and then we process them overnight and then the next day we look at them under the microscope. Next, please. That's for instance, a modified radical mastectomy specimen. It has an ellipse of skin containing the nipple. And on the left side is the axillary tail where the lymph nodes are. And like you see in this uh, specimen, the superior part, you know, the part above the nipple is painted ink and the lower one is yellow and, and probably in the back, it's a different color. Next, please. And that's what we look at under the microscope. That's the slide after processing. It's stained in different kinds of solutions and then we make the diagnosis. Next, please. Different kinds of invasive breast cancer. By far the most common is the invasive ductal carcinoma. That's the most common one, which is 76%. And then the invasive lobular carcinoma, 7%. And then there are some tumors that have lobular and ductal differentiation and mucinous and tubular and medullary and papillary and rare other types constitute the rest of the, of the pie. Next, please. That's a picture of what we see. That's what a normal breast looks like. Some ducts and arranged in a lobular manner and the ducts collect into larger ducts between the lobules and then they collect into the lactiferous ducts that pour into the nipple. So that's normal breast. Next, please. 
and the ductal carcinoma can be invasive and can be in situ. In situ means it's confined to the duct and has not invaded the surrounding tissue. And usually these have the best prognosis. This is on the left side, there is a ductal carcinoma in situ and maybe there's an element around it of invasive cancer as well. But what we're looking at, the main part of the, of the picture is that of a duct distended with tumor cells and in the center it's necrotic, it has no structure, no cells. That's called comedonecrosis. That's usually high-grade intraductal carcinoma in situ. And on the left side, it's the invasive ductal carcinoma. There are tubular differentiation, which the, the areas that have lumen and empty in the center, and then there are solid groups of tumor cells. Here's what I found online. Next, please. And this is lobular carcinoma. The big blue blobs there are the lobules distended with the, the lobular carcinoma in situ. And around them, it's like a swarm of bees, little cells that are called, that these are the invasive lobular carcinoma. Next, please. And this is a picture of a lymph node involved with tumor. There is a red, a pink capsule around surrounding the lymph node. And then there's a rim of, of blue, which is the small lymphocytes that constitute the normal um, lymph node. And then occupying most of the substance of this slide is metastatic carcinoma, which consists of tubules in this case and different ducts, different patterns. Next, please. The parameters addressed in the pathology report are the tumor type, like I mentioned. Is it in situ or is it invasive? And then the tumor grade, how, what's the, and the grade is determined by three parameters. If it's forming tubules, forming tubules it's better differentiated. It's, you know, each one of these parameters is judged on a scale of one to three. If there's a lot of tubular formation, then it's one. If it's no tubular formation, it's three. And then there is in between. And the nuclear polymorphism, if the nuclei of the cells are different uh, shapes and sizes, and again, if it's very high, high polymorphism, it's a three, low polymorphism is one. And mitosis, if there's a lot of mitosis, it's three. And then if it's a few mitosis, it's one. And you add these. Uh, numbers and then you there's a formula if it's uh, you know if it's uh, high grade it's it will be up to nine three and three and three or low grade is three which is one and one and one and then the other parameter is the tumor size of course the larger the tumor size the the worse the prognosis and then, of course, a very important parameter is the margins. We have to comment on the margins, if they're clear or not, and how far is the tumor from the closest margin. And then if there is vascular invasion, that's something that has to be addressed as well. And then if there are lymph nodes involved, we'll address that too. These all help in the prognosis and the definitive treatment. Next, please. And then with every cancer we receive, we do prognostication studies, hormone receptors, estrogen and progesterone, and HER2, and then oncotype DX can be performed on some specimens, and then other uh, things, uh, other genomic studies like MAMA print can be applied to that. Next, please. That's my family. That's increased by one since. Thank you, Dr. Wasa. Thank you. All right. So next with our breast health team, we have a breast surgeon who comes up to Bishop from San Diego once a month. And Dr. Olson joined the district's breast health program in early 2021. She's a graduate of the University of Colorado and Navy trained as she completed her surgical internship and residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. 
She is a board certified general surgeon with expertise in breast, laparoscopic and robotic surgery. She's a member of the American College of Breast Surgeons and trained in oncomplastic surgery. She has served as chief of, chief of surgery for the Scripps Hospital and past governor of the American College of Surgeons. If not at work, you will find Dr. Olson spending time with her family, skiing, biking, and volunteering for surgical mission work. Dr. Olson? Oh, I have to unmute. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, welcome to everyone who's listening. Uh, some of what I have may be a little bit of a, a repeat, but we'll try to get through that quickly. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to address was the risk factors of breast cancer. Um, there's a lot of concern about uh, why did I get breast cancer. Um, we've already covered a little bit about the detection modalities. One of the more important things that um, Dr. Ahmed already hit on is the timing of detection is really critical. The earlier we find a breast cancer, the better a patient should do. Um, that plays right into the stage and uh, uh, obviously the overall survival. And then if we have time, I wanted to just touch on some treatment options and, and clarifying some basics of breast cancer treatment. Go ahead, next slide. So the risk factors, the things we're born with, we can't change our family history, but things that are most significant are those first degree relatives, your mom, your sister, aunts are very important. Um, sometimes there's a gene mutation that's carried in a family that predisposes patients to breast cancer. And then there's some other associated cancer. So BRCA1 and 2 is a mutation that's associated with ovarian cancer. TEC2 is one that's also associated with breast cancer. ATM is a mutation that's associated with melanoma. So if there's a preponderance or an incidence of those tumors in your family, um, we need to know that, and that can help us um, decide to get genetic testing. Race and ethnicity matter, too. It turns out that in the over 40 crowd, white women tend to get breast cancer more than black women. But in the under 40 category, black women have a higher incidence of breast cancer than some white women. So just some uh, general characteristics. Physiologic factors, the age at which we started menstruating, younger is worse, age at your first full-term pregnancy, uh, older is worse because when we get pregnant, we then stop the cycling of our ovaries and therefore we stop the estrogen surge and so pregnancy has actually helped to reduce our risk of breast cancer. Breastfeeding helps. Um, late menopause is uh, worse because, again, you have higher levels of estrogen for longer. Go ahead and go to the next. Environmental and behavior factors. These are things that we might be able to change. Um, toxic exposures come in many different forms, certain uh, environmental things, but one thing that's important, some people get Hodgkin's disease and may get radiation treatment to your chest. We call it the mantle radiation, the node basins, and part of your breast occurs in that area. So you may be at higher risk for getting breast cancer if you've previously had radiation. Alcohol can increase our risk of cancers. Um, my philosophy and, you know, the data is kind of all over the place about alcohol. But the, the take-home message is that one, or, one drink for a woman a day is okay. More than that may increase your risk not only of breast cancer, but esophageal cancer uh, and other cancers because alcohol gets basically turned into a toxin inside our body. Being overweight is also something that increases our risk of breast cancer. We definitely see a higher incidence of breast cancer in obese women and that's because our fat cells tend to hang on to estrogen. So we can actually increase our estrogen levels um, by just being overweight and hanging on to what we have. A lot of women end up taking hormone replacement. Once they hit menopause and start having some side effects of that, the hot flashes, other side effects, they'll start taking estrogen supplements. And that can also 
not really cause breast cancer, but if you're prone to breast cancer or if you're developing a breast cancer that's sensitive to estrogen and you're on that, it's sort of like putting lighter fluid on the fire. So that's not such a good thing. When women are diagnosed with breast cancer, if they happen to be on hormone therapy, we do stop that. And then there's exposure to DES. Diethylstilbestrol is a medication that was used a um, long, long time ago. Stopped using it in the 70s, but there are still women alive who were exposed to this in utero, um, and so that's something that can be a problem. Tobacco is just on my, on my bad list of things. Tobacco, I don't know that there's a direct link to tobacco and breast cancer, but tobacco we know causes lung cancer, increases your risk of esophageal cancer, other cancers, mouth cancers, and it really affects your body in a bad way that makes it more difficult to treat you if you do get breast cancer. Women who get radiation who smoke have much more, many more side effects. If women need a breast reconstruction and they smoke, it's much higher risk and many plastic surgeons won't even do it if you're a smoker. So please keep that in mind. If you're smoking, let's have you stop. Go to the next one, please. So we have detection modalities. We have very high-tech radiology, as you heard. But the thing that's the most available to you is your own hands on your own breast to examine yourself. You should really examine yourself once a month. Try to do it just after your menstrual cycle, because that's the time when your breasts will be the easiest to examine. And uh, a lot of women find their own breast cancers. Go see your doctor. Don't delay. Doctors should do a breast exam. If for some reason they don't, please ask them to do one. Say, I'd really like you to check my breast because that's really, really important. Um, I use ultrasound a lot in my practice. I have an ultrasound machine in the office here in San Diego, and it just helps me to augment everything else that, that we look at. Go to the next slide. So things we look for. Most people know that if you have a lump on your, in your breast, that that's a concern. But other things that may give you a clue that some things go on is a skin dimpling, uh, a nipple discharge, whether it be bloody or clear. Bloody is typically associated with a papilloma, which is a benign tumor. But on rare occasions, that can be a papillary carcinoma. Unusual swelling of the breast or a sudden swelling of the breast can be a sign of breast cancer. If the skin starts to look like an orange peel, that's a problem. Uh, redness, splotchy, warmth could be an infection, could be mastitis, but it could also be uh, breast cancer. And then if you happen to find a lump in the underarm area, the armpit, that's also a sign of possible problem with your breast. It could just be a reactive node. Um, but we would want you to get checked out. So this is just an example. There's a lot of concern about inflammatory breast cancer. It's a pretty devastating cancer. It's difficult to survive, but um, this is an example. As you can see in this picture, this woman has a marked asymmetry of her breast. The right side uh, is much larger. It's slightly red and probably feels firm, it might be warm, and it might be a little bit tender. Now that could be a mastitis, but looking at that, she definitely needs to see a physician and possibly a breast surgeon if antibiotics don't help and get this started resolving. The next slide is also a picture of inflammatory breast cancer. This is obviously much more advanced, um, but if you look at the picture real close, you can see little dimples in the skin, that's that classic orange peel look, and uh, that's a significant change and, and a real problem for this patient. Next. So early detection really does save lives. I think Dr. Ahmed hit on this uh, pretty well, but if we find the cancer early, uh, let's go to the next slide, there's a huge difference in the survival. So if you look at survival by five years, or five-year survival by stage, if you're a stage zero or, or one of those ductal carcinoma in situ, you've got 100% five-year survival. If you come in and we take care of that, um, then you will do very well. 
If it's a stage one and you're treated appropriately, you have a 98% five-year survival. But when the lymph nodes become involved, so the red indicates the lymph node involvement in the armpit, that decreases your survival to 88%. But that's not a huge decline. So it's not a reason to be losing hope if you're diagnosed with breast cancer and you do have lymph node involvement. I know many, many patients who are still alive, enjoying life, and living it to the fullest who had appropriate treatment for a stage two breast cancer. Stage three is a little bit more challenging, and sometimes, you know, patients either come diagnosed as stage four or they develop stage four even though we treated them. Sometimes our treatments aren't adequate, but unfortunately, stage four has about a 16% survival. The next one. Next slide, please, Barb. So just a little bit about stage, and I'll be really quick here. Stage is made up of the tumor size, uh, and it gets a little complicated, but then the nodal status, and then the, the M is whether or not the tumor has spread to other parts of your body. We have a little saying that kind of tries to help us remember it. N plus one is your stage, um, except that if you have a two centimeter tumor, you can be at stage two, but if you're an N1 and a T1, you're a stage two. So N plus one is the stage. Next slide. And this is just a little bit more of the classification. I think we can go through this a little bit faster. Next. And the lymph nodes, quite honestly, I, I remember N1A, and if it's bigger than that, I usually look or talk to the oncologist. Next. Places where breast cancer spreads is to the bone, which is one of the more common places we see it. Liver, brain, and lung are also possible. And on occasion, we'll get met into the ovaries or into the abdomen uh, where the, the bowel and everything is. One thing that we talk a lot about is the characteristics and the prognostic uh, factors. Dr. Wasif mentioned these. Estrogen receptors are sometimes on the tumor, and if they're positive, if they're there, then we can block estrogen as part of our treatment. Progesterone isn't quite as effective or as important, but sometimes that helps us predict how the tumor will behave. And then the HER2 status, which has actually been around, it was really being researched when I was a resident um, back in the 90s. And now it's really a mainstay part of our treatment. If the HER2 status is positive, a lot of women, most women who have that will get chemotherapy. Let's go to the next. So again, this talks about our survival by stage. And if you look at patients with estrogen receptors that are positive, compared to patients who have no estrogen receptor positive and HER2 is negative, there's a fair bit of difference. So the patients with estrogen receptor positivity do better. If it's localized, meaning no lymph nodes, 99% survival versus still a pretty good percentage. Triple negative is a terrible cancer typically, but we still can get 91% five-year survival with uh, an early stage. These patients get chemotherapy but there's a big difference between a 91% survival and 65% when we have lymph nodes that are involved. So in the estrogen positive patients, that's where the big difference really happens, when the lymph nodes are positive. There's distant METs. Um, unfortunately, that's not, we're not so successful in that. But the one thing to note, and I'll talk about, I think, if we have time, but the, in the ER positive group, even with the distant METs and this number of five-year survival of 29%, there's a lot of women who live longer than that. I've seen these women, and our treatments are getting much, much better. There are more of them available. And so that it's not uncommon or unreasonable to think that a woman with bone METs could potentially live another 10 years. So um, next slide. So surgery or treatment includes surgery usually. Um, after that, we do hormone therapy. Chemotherapy can be given before or after surgery. 
and then radiation typically comes after surgery. Fine. So Dr. Wasif mentioned the lumpectomy. That's also known as a partial mastectomy, where we try to take out just part of the breast with the tumor and get clear margins. And those patients traditionally need to be followed with radiation. We have to treat the remainder of the breast tissue um, and make sure we get all the cancer cells. Total mastectomy is where we remove all the breast tissue, and that can be in a total uh, skin sparing technique, or we can remove the, the, all the skin and make the patient's chest flat, or we can save the skin and plan to do a reconstruction. Sometimes we can save the nipple um, in, the right in the right conditions, and then we have some reconstructive options. Lymph node management's a little bit more common or complicated, but what's really changed since I've been a surgeon is the ability to do these sentinel nodes. It's really a strategic removal of lymph nodes that are draining the tumor. We can figure out which, we actually do a little mapping and figure out which nodes are draining that. And if those are negative, we're home free. You know that the remainder of them do not have any tumor in it. But in, some, in the patients who are getting a lumpectomy, you know they're going to get radiation. If they have one or two positive lymph nodes, they can still get uh, just a little more radiation and not have to have all their lymph nodes removed. So that's a big uh, change and, and a help to our patients. We need to remove more lymph nodes and complete the lymph node dissection. Uh, we try to get more than 10 but unfortunately, there's a higher risk of arm swelling or lymphedema in those patients. And that's about all I had. Uh, if there's any questions, those are my two of my favorite people. King Winston on his couch and my daughter. Thank you. And Dr. my husband Olson. is around somewhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Olson. So in part of the breast health team, there is oncology navigation, and that stems from me at the district here and in our community. And um, I'm going to let Barbara pull up the slides. There we go. You can go next. I've actually been part of the district for 13 years, and in the last six years as the oncology navigator, for our community. And um, the concept of oncology navigation actually stems from Dr. Harold Freeman in Harlem in 1990. And he pioneered the navigation process um, due to, uh, to address disparities um, to access to timely diagnosis and treatment particularly from, in, if you look at Harlem, but it was particularly because of the poor and the uninsured patients and, and such. So that's how the concept actually started. And from this navigation model, he was fortunate that Dr. Freeman pushed further and got the Patient Navigator and Chronic Disease Prevention Act that was signed into law by President Bush. And so, that model pushed into other, um, again, chronic diseases so that navigation can be a part of that. Uh, my personal thought is, is navigation should start from the very beginning and navigation is always there and never ends. It continues with patients through survivorship. So um, it goes on and on and on. And it also stems from a big part of it is with navigation is outreach and promoting screening and prevention and, and attacking the areas where disparities are there. So that's a big part of it. And then it's the hands-on piece of it with each patient. Next slide. So a main goal for all navigators, it doesn't matter if it's cancer or other medical conditions, is just to eliminate those barriers to diagnostic treatment and care we, there are many barriers and such, but again, eliminating the barriers with, um, and using as many resources as we, as we can. Next slide. So types of barriers, there are many types, honestly, 
Um, communication, I feel, is one of the biggest pieces of it. And a lot of patients are just, they just don't understand it. They're scared. They don't want to speak up and ask the questions about things. So they might, the doctor might say, oh, you need to get this test on and imaging and have this ultrasound. And they, they, don't, they don't understand the, the need of getting that test done right away. And so I think it's important that we communicate and the, from the medical side of it, communicate that as best we can. And if needed, get the navigation piece of it so that they can reinforce and push that through. A lot of times we see appointments that are waiting for authorizations. That is one of my biggest headaches in the medical system is authorizations. It, it really is hard and it's even more hard in rural America. So I am pushing a lot of things through because of that. Financial situations, um, again, insurance delays and getting that done or insurance companies dictating where patients need to go. And so a lot of times I have to work on letter of agreements with insurance companies and the medical um, partners that we have to work with. Sometimes patients want second opinions and our surgeons, our providers will always recommend that when a patient's not comfortable with what's going on. But again, that can delay care also, especially if you're in rural America and needing to get that done. Uh, psych the psychosocial part of it, that all, everyone goes through. It doesn't matter what we go through in the medical world, that the mental gain really can take an effect on, on delaying care. And I, I had a patient today where it really has delayed her care and in, unfortunately it might take her life. So um, I talked about rural America. <laughs> Transportation is one of uh, a huge piece of difficulty in getting patients to medical care and weather conditions being in an environment where that can possibly have an effect on that. But we try our hardest to, you know, knock those barriers down to child care and such. So um, those are just some of them. Next slide. I think you go back one. There you go. There you go. So I have, since I started doing this, over 400 patients that I've been navigating for cancer alone. That doesn't mean all the other ones that I've been helping, but everyone has different needs. And I recommend anyone working with wherever they're at in any medical organization is see if you have a navigation program, see if there's a navigator there or a social worker that can help direct and such. It's important that we communicate about the different resources that we have, because what we have in the city is what we have here. And it's important for the navigators to push out the local resources as well as the national resources. I'm the biggest advocate for them um, throughout their journey and, and such. I have on the slide, you'll see Angel Flight on there. I use them almost every week and they're a fantastic nonprofit program with volunteer pilots that will fly to the Eastern Sears and take our patients to San Diego, to Arizona, to Utah and such. So, they're a huge piece of what I do in addition to the local research resources that we have with mileage reimbursement programs, um, that we have support groups here in town and we have national support groups. So there is help out there, there are resources out there. And again, if you get into finding who the navigators are, that's gonna be your biggest advocate. I mentioned earlier about medical partners and the medical organizations. I could not do my job without knowing all these organizations and knowing the contacts of all these, especially where we're at. So it's important for me to know who the navigators and social workers are and such. These are just some of the ones that I deal with daily, daily. And um, they help knock the barriers to care down. We help expedite patients' care for oncology and non-oncology issues. And um, it's really am amazing work that we do together in taking care of patients. Next slide. So I mentioned outreach and screening activities. Right now we have Moonlight Mammogram actually going on right now um, in the district. And that is an outreach activity for breast screening. We've actually done colorectal screening, outreach activities and such. 
we do employer talks and have our Dr. Olson went to Vons this week and did an, two employer talks within the last month um, and such. But we have done talks to DWP, Caltrans, Inumono Title, and such. And it's really important for us to spread the word and use, use the public, use the community to talk to their sisters and their family members about how important it is to get screening. And what Dr. Olson said also is see your doctor see your doctor once a year. And for those who are not on track because of COVID and such, we just really pushing getting back on track. Next slide. So I took this quote from one of the medical oncologists that I work with at City of Hope, and it really stuck with me. It's actually pinned up on my computer. And there are days where I'm dealing with patients where they're just struggling. And, it, and it's really, I just saw that as something important, but I'll read it. It says, fight implies winning or losing. It is important to experience the journey, which is filled with ups and downs. There will be turns along the path, but focus on today. Today is what we have. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow is not promised. And so thank you very much for joining us. And I'm going to introduce our next presenter, and that's the other piece of our breast health team that we have. And she, this is NIH, NIHD's excited about Dana Georgeson. She joined our district earlier this year with her expertise in treating patients with lymphedema and has been a certified lymphedema therapist since 2010. She attended Loma Linda University where she attained her master's in physical therapy. She has a special interest in lymphedema women's health and acute care, and her hobbies include traveling, outdoor activities, and knitting. Dana? There I am, I think. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me on the Doobie Artist team. Um, there is a lot of amazing information, and as I'm listening to this, I want everybody to feel supported and that you've got a lot of experience available to you and a lot of resources. And we're um, happy to help you. Rosie's amazing as far as resources go. Um, so my piece with the um, whole journey um, with cancer treatment and recovery, obviously physical therapy and rehab, but more specifically lymphedema, so you heard um, several of the physicians speak about lymph nodes. So lymphedema and what is it and what can I do about it? Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. I'll keep it brief, a lot of information, but I want you to not feel overwhelmed with now what's going on. Um, so if you can switch to the next slide. Um, we'll talk about lymphedema. So it's just an abnormal accumulation of lymphatic fluid in your lymphatic system um, caused by either damage or an excessive burden. Um, as far as breast cancer goes, typically because of um, damage um, due to treatment. Um, so then cool lymphedema in this lymphatic system. So what is your lymphatic? So the next slide, we'll talk about that a little bit. Your lymphatic system um, is a crucial player in your immune system. Where your blood travels, your lymphatic system travels. Um, your lymphatic system is um, responsible for collecting cellular waste um, along the way. Uh, and your vessels pick up what it comes across, carries it to nodes, recognize lymph nodes. So if they're damaged to where you think of um, road construction and traffic to be um, diverted, or at the hub, um, after interaction named lymph node, um, you uh, will have um, uh, an interruption in the system and then you have a backup. So your lymphatic system um, is responsible for your, your immune response essentially, which is why it's so important to keep up with it. Um, and then the next slide. So lymphedema, why is it so bad? Why do I need to pay attention to it? 
So besides the obvious, you'll um, see, you've probably seen extreme cases. The uh, limbs can be different sizes, um, but because it's so responsible, your lymphatic system is so responsible for your immune response, um, you're at risk for secondary infections if you have an accumulation of um, lymphatic fluid or lymphedema. Um, cellulitis, and um, it makes it um, more difficult for your body to respond to any infections um, or flu, cold, whatever. If you are, if they already had that burden um, of a mechanical disruption, um, it's m more difficult for your body to manage any other um, burden placed on it. Next slide, please. So what can um, PT or treatment do to help? Um, there's specific um, tools and techniques that are very specific to lymphedema because it is such a sensitive system and um, very particular in how it responds um, and how it needs to be treated um, to not cause other damage or just move the problem somewhere else. So it includes massage, bandaging, compression garments, along with exercise, and making sure that you have all the information um, to keep your limb and yourself safe, um, such as ways to protect that arm, um, making sure that you're eating your fruits and vegetables, staying hydrated, taking care of yourself. Um, so lymphedema therapist has been trained in a, this specific technique to treat lymphedema. Um, People may have been introduced to it, but the um, training to become a certified lymphedema therapist is fairly intensive um, and very specific. So I would encourage you to seek someone out who has actually has a certification so that you get proper treatment. Um, next slide, please. So how do you know that you have lymphedema? It's rarely painful. You will less likely feel pain and more of a heaviness in your limb, um, leg, arm, breast um, cancers typically in arm, um, as you have those axillary um, nodes um, either removed or um, radiation um, to the area. It'll feel heavy, you'll feel like a fullness in your hand, maybe your rings will fit differently, or you notice that a sleeve um, doesn't feel the same on either side be less likely um, pain is the cater. Um, next slide. Please. Uh, so risk factor for secondary lymphedema. Secondary lymphedema, you might be wondering, secondary lymphedema is uh, caused by scent. So treatment for breast cancer in this instance. So radiation, surgery, tumors, um, lymph node involvement, you've heard um, the physicians speak about that. Um, cancer um, spreading and maybe another tumor pressing on your lymphatic system or lymph nodes. And as you heard before, being overweight and eating in a healthy diet because your um, lymphatic system is part of your immune system, you want to feed your immune system to use to help fight off infections. So you really want to be careful about um, diet and lifestyle to minimize the um, risk and or severity of lymphedema. Slide, please. Um, how would you access treatment? Rosie is a good resource. She can point you in the right direction. If you're in our area, if you're out of our area, like I said, um, seek out um, your physician and then a certified lymphedema therapist. If you have any questions um, for us, you can give us a call. Um, this number is my number at this clinic. Um, when you get an order or Rosie refers you and help, can help you navigate that, um, we're happy to get you going. The easier you seek treatment, the easier it is to manage and stay on top of and much less overwhelming. Like all the other physicians pointed out, the earlier the, um, the detection, the easier it is to stay on top of. That's it. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to holler. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Great job. Great job.
So this is the part of our talk that we are going to go to question and answers. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask, please put them in the chat room and such. We have a question actually for Dr. Wasseth. And it says, do you examine all tumors to determine oncotype DX when there is there is more than one mass? When there is more than one, I didn't get the, the last part. Yeah, it says, um, do you examine all tumors to determine oncotype DX when there's more than one mass? More than one what? Mass. One mass? No, only one. Right, Dr. Olson? Typically, if there are it's a multifocal tumor, you would assume they're going to be both the same, but sometimes we will request the estrogen receptors be done on both if there's some concern that maybe there's heterogeneity, mm -hmm. uh, but typically we usually just do one. Sure. Muted. We had another question, actually, and this one's for Dana. Maybe it can be a little, um, some specifics on why we use compression. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. That's for the radiologist, Dr. Ahmed. Why is compression needed for mammography? Why is it so important? <clears throat> the compression is important. Uh, separate the tissues out from laying on top of each other and that's why it can be painful but they want the tissue basically to be as flat as possible especially if you have denser breasts um, just so you can see it better and things don't overlap Dr. Olson mentioned alcohol increasing risks. Is there anything else we can do to lower risk of developing breast cancer like diet and exercise? Well, I think diet and exercise is, is great. And if you're fit and keep your body, you know, your body weight in the ideal uh, range, that's going to be the best. Um, you know, there's a lot of thoughts about whether organic is healthier. Uh, my general philosophy is to moderation in, in things, all things. Um, but the, the exercise um, recommendations are really that you get your heart rate up for 30 minutes a day, for like five days a week. It's a lot. Most of us don't achieve that. But, you know, if you have the opportunity to walk a little extra, park your car farther away from the door, those kinds of things, can matter. Taking the stairs when you could take the elevator, those are good ways of getting in a little bit more cardiovascular exercise uh, to stay healthy. Did it, hopefully that answered the question. We have a YouTube question. And again, I think this is for you, Dr. Ahmed. It says, when should we stop doing mammograms? Is there an appropriate age? Uh, the recommendations we follow says there's no there's no age to stop. Um, you know, some places will say 75, but or 74, but we we always recommend after 40 to try to get an annual mammogram, mainly because you can still develop a cancer even when you're older, and there are good available at the time. Dr. Olson, did you, want to elaborate that, on that? Hmm? did you want to elaborate on well, that? Yeah, typically I recommend that my patients, as long as they're able to get out of the house and come to get a mammogram, they really should. If their health has failed so much that it's really a major ordeal, then chances are they're going to have something that takes their life before a breast cancer would. But you know, my own mother had a mammographically detected breast cancer recurrence at 81, and she had that taken care of 
and now she's going on 85 and super healthy. And she's not going to die from breast cancer, but she's had it twice. So if she hadn't gotten that mammogram, that tumor would have grown. It could have spread to her lymph nodes, and it could have shortened her life substantially. Go get your mammogram. All right, so we have another question in the chat. What is the role of ultrasound and MRI in breast cancer detection? Is that for Dr. Ahmed? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, either way, um, you know, right now they're complement. I would say ultrasound and MRI is both complementary to mammogram. Mammograms are still the mainstay and what's been studied the most, but we we'll usually use ultrasound as an adjunct to it uh, and or MRI in case they're both unique in finding things. Sometimes mammograms can't. Um, and especially for, say, for high-risk people, we recommend ultrasound and MRIs are recommended at a younger age uh, because they can sometimes find cancers that a mammogram can't. But as far as normal screening, we still recommend the mammograms. Dr. Olson, do you have, you can add? I, I would agree with you completely. I think the mammogram is the most efficient way to screen but when you have patients who are at higher risk or have the denser breast tissue, ultrasound is my first go-to because it's much easier to do, it's less expensive, and there's no contrast involved. Um, you know, when you get into the MRIs, I think they are so sensitive that we find more false positives with MRI, and then we're obligated to chase that down and may end up doing an MR-guided biopsy, which is more involved. And if you're, you know, you might be able to speak to the, you know, potential side effects from MRI and the gadolinium, but there is a little bit of concern if you're getting an MRI every year. And if you start when you're young, I think that can be a problem. So I, I try not to use MRI as a screening tool. I try to use it as a problem-solving I completely agree. Uh, yeah, the MRI, you know, it can find things that aren't cancers, but can, can mimic them. And if it's not something we see on the ultrasound or mammogram, it still puts us in a bind to just leave it alone. So I agree. I think the MRI is a great problem, problem solving tool and, impor and important in some people who've had either a high risk of brain, breast cancer or have had previously very aggressive breast cancers. But for screening, uh, it's not something I would recommend for everyone. Well, this is Joy Inglid. I just had a question for Dana. Are there any dangers with lymphedema treatment? Um, the concern is if there is an untreated active cancer in an area, we try to avoid like actively um, moving lymphatic fluid away from that area. Um, if I get clearance from the physician that maybe it's active cancer, but there's chemo on board or radiation, um, sometimes it can be sort of like um, a comfort um, thing because the swelling, if it's left untreated and again, risk of infection, it can be um, used as um, sort of like less pain um, and uh, to stay on top of the swelling. If there's treatment on board, um, there's less of a risk. Um, but if it's unaddressed, then um, it might be um, a man um, uh, best to just uh, begin with compression before ma the manual lymph drainage. Um, bef um, yeah, before aggressively moving that lymphatic fluid away from an active area. We'll just um, get fit for a compression garment to wear um, throughout the day just to be supportive of um, the swelling that can accumulate rather quickly, depending on the severity. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if Rosie's having technical problems, but um, I guess I'll take the liberty of thanking all of you for uh, being here and sharing your information. 
Um, I think we had a lot of people watching on YouTube and, and some on Zoom. Um, this was really helpful. Um, I think a, a really good way to end the month of breast cancer awareness. Um, I don't see that there's any other um, questions from the um, listeners. So again, thank you for uh, your time and your information. Much appreciated. And thank you all for joining, um, for everyone listening. And this will be posted um, and will be um, uh, able to be viewed later. So thank you. Have a good night.